now. Um, and so you're okay. able, everyone's able to hear you, which is great. Um, and okay. we're gonna get started in just a minute. I'm just setting up our live streaming, streaming to YouTube um, and then we'll be ready to go. So there it goes. All right, it's all set. Perfect. Okay, so welcome everybody uh, to our second session with the Observer's Handbook. Today, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I am Jenna. I'm the Youth Outreach Coordinator, among other things, at the RESC. And we have James Edgar here, as always. James is the editor of the handbook and knows a great many things about a great many things. Um, and then today, our guest is Roy Bishop, who wrote so many sections of the Observer's Handbook. Um, but today, we're going to uh, Roy's going to tell us a bit about time and optics and observing. Um, Roy wrote a couple bits and pieces of both of these sections. He wrote the entire time section, a little bit on the optics and observing as well. Uh, and that's what we're going to focus on for today's session. Um, if you have anything, any questions as we go, you can ask them in the Q&A and I will relay them to James and to um, Roy. I'm going to set us up in gallery view so you can see us all. Just a heads up, Roy is on the phone, so he will not be, he'll be following along with his actual copy of the Observer's Handbook. I am going to share uh, my screen with the electronic copy so you guys can all follow along. Um, if, again, if you have any questions uh, in the chat or in the Q&A and we will do our best to answer them. Thanks everybody for joining and I will allow James to begin a small introduction before Roy tells us a little bit more. James, over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Good to be here. I just wanted to uh, say that the Observer's Handbook isn't intended to be a book that you go through from cover to cover. You can certainly do that. However, it's pretty dry reading. Mm -hmm. But if you were to get into, say, the time section and you wanted to delve into it, you can use all sorts of resources that are online to get an even better or more broad and uh, understanding of time. Time, of course, is a human construct. It's, uh, you know, without clocks, we wouldn't be able to, to keep time. So we have to have some method of me measuring it. And once you measure it, then that's time. <laughs> it's a very complex situation. And I think Roy's article in the, or the section there, Time and Time Scales, explains it very, very well. So, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that under optics and observing, there's a tremendous amount of information in this few short pages that goes from page 49 to 93, so a little bit less than 50 pages, and it's chock full of information. So you could spend a lot of time reading this stuff, and you would be able to make yourself into an expert. Pick up a section and start reading it, and if you can understand it, you can explain it to people. So. Here we go. I'm going to turn this over to Roy and let him expound on time. <laughs> okay, thank you, James. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. We can hear you just fine. Okay, good. Good. Um, I'm, I have my observer's handbook open uh, to page 39, and I'm going to uh, give a brief a summary or sketch of what's in those first few pages starting at page 39. Of course, the, the topic is time and time scales. There's a lot in there, and I made it as short and as concise as I could when I uh, made up this, the text in the handbook. And today I'd like to just speak to it for a bit. Uh, there are three obvious aspects of time that impact life on the third planet. Uh, the longest of the three aspects is the seasonal cycle, the year. Another one which is not so obvious to uh, people in the modern light-polluted world is the month, or the moon, if you like. It's uh, basically connected to the uh, synodic cycle of the moon, the phases of the moon, the time from new, new moon to new moon. is roughly one month. And, of course, the shortest of the three that is perhaps most obvious is the day. 
our own bodies are have an internal clock which is uh, very very close to the 24-hour day and uh, we notice that especially if we try to stay up for more than 18 or 20 hours the day is the uh, key interval that uh, is addressed in the handbook in this section and the day is fine you can watch the sun rise and set but uh, if you want to live in our in the modern world and keep your appointments you mm -hmm. have to have a clock and a clock essentially is a device that subdivides the day into smaller units and makes it available so we can determine uh, at what point in any given day we have to uh, hop in the car and go for a dentist appointment or what have you. Clocks, initially the first successful clocks that uh, were uh, at all accurate enough to uh, keep appointments, they were based on the pendulum as the fundamental timekeeper in the clock. And it was Christian Huygens back in 1657 who invented the first practical pendulum clock, although Galileo had an idea for one, but he, he never had a chance to build it. Anyway, Huygens built the first pendulum clock, and within a very few years after 1657, it was developed into quite an accurate timekeeper. And remarkably, the pendulum-based clock was the best timekeeper people had for nearly three centuries, uh, even up until I was a young child. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember in the train station in my hometown, there was a very nice clock with a big pendulum in it, and that was what uh, was used to keep time back in those days. About the same era, in the 1940s, the pendulum clock was superseded by the quartz crystal clock. And even today, the quartz crystal is by far the most common timekeeper because uh, anybody that wears a wristwatch or has a battery-operated clock on the uh, kitchen wall, uh, today those clocks are all keyed to a quartz crystal. Hmm. And uh, the quartz crystal is more accurate than the pendulum clock certainly for a low price clock. It's uh, quite remarkable. Uh, you can buy a quartz crystal wristwatch today and uh, it's more accurate than the very expensive pendulum clocks were a century ago. Roy, can I ask you a, a question that just out of my own interest? Um, yes. About pendulum clocks. How? Uh, so I, I know when you see a grandfather clock, you see it ticking back and forth. How does it know exactly what a second is? Uh, because the person that made the clock adjusted the length of the pendulum. The longer the pendulum, the longer it takes to go through one swing. Hmm. So if you adjust the length, the, uh, you can set the uh, length such that uh, complete oscillation over and back takes one second. Okay, cool. Can you see that one yeah. up over my right shoulder there, Jenna? Over oh, yeah, way in the background there. I see it, yeah. So I can adjust the width of that pendulum, not the length. Okay. And it, it'll oscillate at a different rate. So if it's fast or slow, I can adjust the little weights on each side to make it go faster or slower. That's very cool. The 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 yeah. reason I ask is because the um the person the explorer in me and the per the outdoorsy person in me wants to know if I can make a clock out of like a string and a rock, um if I know the right length to make it, um, yes. which I, I can I, if I look it up, I'll, I can find the right length. Yes, but uh, a, a rock on a string will swing or oscillate at, you can adjust it to uh, count seconds, but uh, it's not a very good clock to, you can't carry it on or wear it on your wrist. And uh, without a, a mechanical counter, uh, connected to the pendulum, there's not going to be a dial that you can read 
come back in an hour and see what time it is. Okay, good point. You have, so to, sit there. You have to sit there and count the seconds. Okay, so maybe a sundial would be better in my outdoorsy end of the world view where I'm alone. That's in the right. Okay. <laughs> I, I should mention that the a quartz crystal based clock. Uh, I took one apart once, a wristwatch, to see what the crystal looked like. And lo and behold, away inside in a little metal container, which I had to cut apart, I found a quartz crystal that looks like a tuning fork, uh, a musical tuning fork, cool. except it was made of quartz, and it was only about three millimeters long, very, very tiny. And those things oscillate about 32,000 times per second. And they have a little uh, electronic circuit in the wristwatch that counts those 32-some thousand oscillations every second. And when it reaches that count, it moves the second hand on the watch by one notch for one second. And That's then it so counts cool. another 32,000 for the second second and so on. Anyway, it, it's basically like a pendulum. It's a mechanical thing that... Uh, oscillates. Of course, a pendulum is swung by gravity, whereas a quartz crystal is uh, swung or oscillates because of its own elasticity. And of course, it, it has to be driven as does a pendulum. A pendulum has an escapement. A, a quartz crystal tuning fork has an electrical thing that pulses it. And this is why if the quartz crystal watch needs a battery to power it. Very cool. Okay. So I, I never knew that. And I am a big proponent of learning all this stuff on your own. So if you have an old watch in your house, I recommend taking it apart like Roy, because I think that sounds cool. But make yeah, sure you, you really ask me. To, you Go really ahead. have to take it apart right down to find out, to find the little crystal and look at it. But it, it's a beautiful little thing. Um, I also, I also anyway. recommend if you're going to do that, definitely ask the owner of the watch before you do it. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Anyway, the quartz crystal uh, based clocks came in the 1940s, so uh, a little over half a century ago, and it was superseded. It only lasted about 20 years as the uh, fundamental or most accurate type of clock. Contrast that with the pendulum, which lasted almost three centuries. In the 1960s, a more accurate clock was made based on the cesium atom. There's a transition in a single cesium atom, which can be accessed electronically. And uh, the beauty of an atom is that uh, it doesn't get rusty, it, it's not affected by anything, and if you can make it oscillate, in the case of the cesium atom, it's the spin of the single electron, single valence electron that flips over. Anyway, it can be coupled to an electronic circuit and that to a clock dial, which will tell you the time. But a cesium oscillator is uh, more stable and therefore more accurate than even a quartz crystal. So the, the best clocks we have today in wide circulation are cesium-based clocks. Okay. So that, that's the, a bit of history behind clocks. And uh, the only, uh, of those three types of clocks, the only ones that uh, you can hear and watch the, the fundamental part of the clock is the old pendulum clock. You can watch the pendulum swing, and it'll tick if it's a grandfather clock. The length is such that every tick is one second. Okay. So we have clocks. Now, the day is connected to Earth's rotation. That's the horizon setting of the sun day and night. And concerning Earth's rotation, you have to have a reference point. And there are at least three possible reference points. Uh, an obvious one is, well, how long does it take for the Earth to do exactly one rotation? And for that, you don't want to look at the moon, certainly, or even the sun, uh, because one rotation of the Earth has to be uh, 
determined in ter- uh, with reference to distant galaxies, assuming those distant galaxies are essentially stationary, at least over a human lifetime. But there aren't any, uh, there's no time scale that has been devised based on rotation of Earth res- with respect to the, the galaxies. Uh, the Another way of doing that is to refer the rotation of the Earth to the right ascension declination grid, which uh, astronomers are often used to specify where things are in the sky. And the the zero point for the RA deck grid is the vernal equinox, which is where the Earth's equatorial plane and the Earth's orbital planes intersect on the first day of spring. That's where the sun uh, is located in the sky. So that so, for, right, that's 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 called the spring equinox or the vernal equinox. So if you use that as a reference point, uh, you can set up or people have set up time scales relative to that, and those time scales are called sidereal time. And just sorry, quickly, in lay in layperson's terms, um, for the equinox, when you were saying it, it intersects the equatorial, it's I. I'm not a great astronomer in this area, so that basically means that the sun is directly over the equator um, when it's heading northward in the sky. Is that right? That, 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 that's correct. Okay. That's where the sun is on the uh, about the third week of March, okay. the beginning of our, our spring in the northern hemisphere. Thank anyway, you. That, that's the uh, reference point uh, for the right ascension declination grid. And the... Uh, Right ascension of the vernal equinox, of course, is what uh, we define as zero hours of right ascension. And anyway, coming back to Earth's rotation, um, the time for Earth to rotate once relative to the vernal equinox is uh, 24 sidereal hours. And if you use Greenwich, England, as your reference, which is, uh, of course, the reference for longitude on Earth, zero degrees longitude, then if you stand at, on the uh, zero longitude line running through Greenwich Observatory in England, the time there is called Greenwich Mean Sidereal Time. Okay. F- uh, for somebody in in Ontario or any other place on Earth, of course, it's if you want to uh, have a time scale that matches uh, what you see in terms of day and night, it's not with respect to the vernal equinox at all. It's with respect to the sun. And if you use the actual sun on a particular day, what you have then for a clock is uh, a sundial. Mm. So you can talk about sundial time or apparent solar time. So when the sun is highest in the sky and halfway between its rising in the east and setting in the west, that would be 12 hours noontime, apparent solar time. But the sun's progress during the year against the background stars is a little complicated uh, for two reasons. One is that our orbit around the sun is not a circle. Um, it's an ellipse. Uh, it looks like a circle, but it, it's actually squashed a bit. And because of that, the sun's eastward motion from day to day varies through the year. And uh, if if you use uh, sundial time, of course, the sundial follows that variation, but that's not very nice to have a time scale that varies uh, from day to day, week to week, month to month. So uh, we talk about a mean sun, which is a fictitious sun that moves eastward against the stars like the real sun, but it does so parallel to the equator, and it does so at a uniform rate, such that after one year, it uh, coincides again with the actual sun. Anyway, that's called the mean sun, and time with respect to the mean sun 
for anybody anywhere on Earth, that's local mean time. If you're standing in Greenwich, England, uh, that's local mean time at Greenwich, which is uh, what we call universal time. Okay. And uh, if, if you check the Observer's Handbook and the month-by-month sections, the, the times there are all universal time or local mean time on the Greenwich Meridian in England. Okay. So now we're starting to get down to what's in the handbook. <laughs> um, many years many years ago, the times of events in the handbook were given according to uh, Eastern Standard Time, basically Standard Time uh, in Ontario. And that was used for many years in the handbook because the RASC was started in Toronto, of course, and uh, for quite some time, uh, the the uh, society was the center of mass of the society, so to speak, was uh, centered around Toronto. Mm-hmm. But back in with the 1982 edition of the handbook, uh, Eastern Standard Time was uh, replaced by Universal Time because. It was felt that the the handbook has wider circulation than beyond Ontario, Mm -hmm. and it made sense to uh, accommodate everybody in the same way by switching to universal time, local mean time at Greenwich. Um, Now, those times, serial time, uh, mean time, universal time, are all linked to Earth's rotation. But the problem that was discovered, and this happened oh, nearly a century ago now, there was something wrong. Um, the Earth's rotation appeared to vary a bit, and the harder it was looked at, the uh, firmer that conclusion came that uh, Earth is not a good clock. Mm-hmm. Uh, One reason it varies, over the long term, tidal friction, the ocean tides are dragging on the spinning Earth, and those tides are slowing the Earth's spin down to a very, very small amount every year, but it accumulates. Mm. Uh, Another problem is that uh, Earth is not a solid body of rock. Uh, Most of the Earth is liquid. The mantle and the core, there are currents down deep inside the earth, and they're not uh, they're not steady. They, they themselves vary, and that makes the uh, spin of the earth, aside from tidal slowing, it makes the spin of the earth speed up a little, slow down a little, in an almost random or at least unpredictable way. Ocean currents also affect. Uh, the spin of the Earth, when, uh, like the Gulf Stream, if the Gulf Stream slows down or speeds up or changes direction, that will affect the spin of the Earth, uh, how quickly it's turning. Uh, the lunar tides, which vary with the distance of the Moon from the Earth and uh, with the phase of the Moon, and that will change the spin of the earth. Uh, the winds blowing over the surface and the pressure variations from high and low pressure systems, that affects the spin of the earth. So it's a real mess. <laughs> so so earth's turning is not uh, good enough for modern timekeeping. And when that was realized by the middle of the last century, Astronomers came up with a time which they called ephemeris time, or ET. That's not extraterrestrial, it's <laughs> ephemeris time. Uh, that uh, was officially adopted in 1952, and it was based on not the spinning of the Earth, but uh, measuring Earth's time to go around the sun, uh, measuring the periods of other planets going around our sun. It was quite awkward to do, but uh, the precision of the measurements was such that it was doable with enough, with enough work, and uh, it formed the basis of ephemeris time. 
okay. which uh, was believed to be perfectly uniform. At least no variations had been detected in it. And that was used for about 30 years, up till 1984. Uh, I mentioned the cesium clock. Uh, it was uh, developed in the 1960s, and it, it appeared uh, shortly after that time, in the 1970s, that uh, it might be possible to use the cesium atom as the basis of time rather than the complicated orbital motions of the bodies in the solar system, at least if it was a cesium atom reading to a, a dial on a cesium clock, that was a heck of a lot simpler than uh, digging out the telescopes, studying the planets, mm -hmm. and averaging numbers, etc. Ephemer's time was hard to figure, even though apparently it was quite accurate. Anyway, the, the cesium clock uh, was adopted uh, in 1984 for the basis of uh, the best time scales we have. And that uh, the, the cesium second is known as the SI second. SI, that's uh, French for System International, or the International System. And uh, there's a whole system of units, so-called SI units, uh, besides time that we have today. Anyway, the SI second is the one we're using today. And another feature that uh, appeared in considerations by the 1980s was that uh, relativity theory had to be considered. Prior to that, mm -hmm. precision was not good enough that astronomers had to worry about that character, Albert Einstein, and his <laughs> fire out theories. But uh, once we had cesium clocks, uh, it, the relativistic effects, which are small within the solar system, system still they had to be taken into account. And... <clears throat> We've stuck with the SI second, mm -hmm. the cesium second, but today there are about four or five other time scales all linked to it, but uh, with relativistic uh, adjustments. These are in the handbook. <laughs> oh, wow. I don't know if, any, if anybody reads all the, those pages in that first section of time, but they're, they're in there. Is uh, that the, is that page forty three that you're talking about? Uh, it is. It starts on page thirty nine. What I've been talking about, and yeah. uh, what I'm start, about to mention is on page thirty forty three. You're right. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And uh, what, one of them is the acronyms are convenient. TCB. It's French, but if you read it backward, it's very, very centric coordinate time. Or reading the letters backward, B C T. Anyway, T C B, very centric coordinate time. That's the time that a an S I cesium clock would have sitting at the center of mass of the solar system, which of course is somewhere within the sun usually. Okay. As if the whole solar system weren't there. Wow. Okay. Now that that that's obviously a theoretical or <laughs> an idealistic uh, thing, but uh, that that that's a cesium clock located at the center mass of the solar system, without the solar system present. That's as hmm. pure nice clock as you could have, I guess. TCG hmm. is. Uh, geocentric coordinate time, and that's at the center of mass of the Earth, as if the Earth weren't there, but mm -hmm. all the rest of the solar system bodies are present, namely the sun and the other planets and so on. And that clock, even though it's uh, an SI cesium-based clock, loses about half a second a year relative to this TCB clock, 
that I first mentioned a moment ago. And the reason it loses is because Earth, which in this idealized case is not even there, Earth orbits the sun. It's moving relative to the sun. And uh, also, Earth sits quite deeply in the gravitational field of the sun. The motion causes time dilation. The Earth's TCG clock goes slower, and it also goes extra slow because it's sitting deep in the gravitational well of the sun. So it loses about half a second a year relative to TCB. And then there's TT, terrestrial time, which is a, a cesium clock sitting on at sea level on Earth. And it actually loses relative to the uh, geocentric coordinate clock about 22 milliseconds a year. Why? Because Earth is present and that clock sits within the gravitational field of the Earth and gravitational redshift means it runs slow by 22 milliseconds a year. So there you have TCB, TCG, and TT, three idealized theoretical clocks. Wow. Then you've got to have real clocks if you want to actually look at something and get the time. <laughs> there's, there, there are several hundred cesium clocks located here and there over the Earth in various uh, national scientific labs. And those are compared one to the other uh, several times a year to come up with an average. And that is the uh, time that uh, astronomers actually uh, use because the... the three earlier time scales, those are fictitious, theoretical, ideal things, to actually read the time, you need real clocks. <laughs> That's all very tricky. So, so that the average of the clocks scattered about the Earth, the season clocks, is the time scale is TAI, which is International Atomic Time. Okay. And if you go to page 44 in the handbook at the top of the uh, page, there's a little diagram that yeah. I put in there, and it's arranged vertically and according to rate. In other words, a, a clock higher up goes, ticks faster, and a clock more to the left is running behind. There's a leg. And there you see TT, TAI, and UTC. I've talked about TT and TAI. TAI, again, is the average of the cesium clocks over the Earth. And uh, for historical reasons, it differs. It's running slow, relative, not ticking slow, but it's lagging TT by 32.184 seconds. And that's fixed by agreement. And it, why that number was a historical artifact, not so important. So just to, just to um, let you know, Roy, um, we usually try yes. to keep sessions down to about half an hour, and we're at 35 minutes now. Um, are you able to cover... Oh, okay. That's okay. It's okay. Um, are you able... To, and I think folks are finding it interesting. Everyone's staying, which is great. Um, so if yeah. you're able to well, sort of... We have 70, 77, 76 people, something like that here right now. Um, and so that's wonderful. I was wondering if uh, I just to try to give it an end point of about either 415 or 420 or so. Um, sorry, for your time, that would be 5.15 or 5.20. Um, is that, do you sure. think you can, you can yeah, accomplish Yeah, well, I'll, I'll wrap up the time part okay. here shortly. <laughs> I, I won't have time to go too far into the optics, but we can always do that at another webinar. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, that diagram at the top of page 44, the one thing I haven't talked about is UTC, UTC Coordinated Universal Time, and that is the time that... Uh, people use on Earth, uh, the general population, various countries. And it um, is shifted to the left in that diagram because we try to keep it close to universal time. And it has to lie within 0.9 seconds. If, it, if UT1 or UT uh, slows down or drifts, 
relative to UTC, we adjust UTC by one second. Typically, because UT1 is running slower, ticking slower, um, every year or two we have to add one second to UTC. So, it, mm -hmm. it, uh, as the little dotted line shows, it, it tries to keep on top of UT1 there. Is that and when that's the basis of civil time in all the countries in the world. Of course, there are 24 time zones scattered around the world, depending upon where you live. And uh, where I am is one hour different from where you are in Ontario. Mm -hmm. And so your, your wristwatch is uh, on UT, UTC. Um, when it jumps by one second to catch up with UT1, most people don't worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I, I'll stop there with that time section. And I have, uh, just before just before you go to the optics section, we have a question from Alice Sterling. I'm not sure if you'll know uh, the answer to this one, but it, the question makes me laugh, which is, why are my Canon camera time clocks so awful? Some lose or some lose some gain more than 1.2 seconds per day. My digital watch in high school was better than that, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, the little. Uh, uh, I've uh, followed uh, the, the running of uh, wristwatches based with, on uh, the quartz crystal over the years. And um, the people that make wristwatches or clocks within the Canon camera, whatever, they, they don't take time to uh, trim the little crystal so it is wow. really close to the SI second. Um, I think it's a matter of uh, time to do it, and time costs money, and uh, uh, they know the public doesn't really care if a clock <laughs> loses or gains a second or two a day. Well, they clearly don't know the RASP membership. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so if, if you could uh, look at a dozen watches in the, the jewelry store, check them against the uh, uh, time signal from the uh, NRC Ottawa, and then come back a month later <laughs> and see how they're doing. And then you could pick out the watch that just by sheer accident happens to be the most accurate of the group. Oh, good <laughs> advice, I like it. To, <laughs> the same would apply to, a, I don't know, a, a dozen Canon cameras. But uh, of course, nobody does that. and. Uh, Anyway, <laughs> all right, folks, you heard it from the time master. You got to do your own yeah. experiments in the watch in the camera store. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, the public gets what it uh, is happy with, and uh, they're not going to spend any money to give the public something better. So that's the answer to uh, Alistair's question. All right. I hope that's adequate. <laughs> that's very reasonable. Yeah. Now, I'll flip over a few pages. The optics and observing session starts on page 49. We are with and you. And the first page there I, is a, a summary uh, of the equations that are important uh, to the optics of a telescope and the, the summary of the performance uh, quantities that are important for a telescope and some numerical values at the bottom of the page for typical amateur telescopes. Um, it's something you just have to read. Uh, if anybody had a question, I could uh, address those questions on that. Uh, so far, no, but if anybody has questions, feel free to send them into the Q&A and I will um, uh, say them aloud so that Roy can answer. Sure. Or you could uh, give anybody who's interested my email address and they could uh, send the question directly to me. Okay, just so you don't get bombarded with emails, what I will do is I will send my email address, which everybody pretty much already has. And if you have a question for Roy, I can forward it on to him. Uh, so okay, and, I, and I, I can uh, answer by email to the individual who has the question. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the, the following page uh, goes into some discussion of uh, 
telescope exit pupils. And again, uh, I, I don't want to read the text to anybody. The thing is summed up in a way in the diagram on page 52. And it, it's a useful diagram. All you have to know for about your telescope is the focal ratio of the objective lens or the objective mirror. For instance, a typical uh, Dobsonian Newtonian telescope has an F ratio of about 4.5. And if you take the diagram on page 52 and run a straight line from the lower left corner up to that scale that is spread across the uh, upper right corner, you'll find 3, 4, 5 marked there. Uh, 4.5, of course, is halfway between 4 and 5. So if you run a straight line from the bottom left corner up to the 4.5 mark and just run a line in there with a pencil or ink, doesn't matter, um, then that diagram is set up for you to uh, use, and you can use it, uh, I guess, most typically if you say, here's the F ratio of my telescope. I've drawn the line. Um, what does the diagram tell me? Well, if you use the bottom axis, the eyepiece focal length scale at the bottom, and you're you have a particular eyepiece, say it's a 20 millimeter eyepiece, you go to the 20 there, you run vertically upward until you intercept the diagonal line that you've drawn in and go directly left to the vertical scale. And it tells you the size of the exit pupil that your telescope will give you with that particular eyepiece. Okay. And the exit pupil is a very useful thing to know because that determines uh, the sort of magnification your telescope gives, whether it's high, medium, low, or rich field range, which are discussed in the text there. And uh, I've drawn in a line at 4.5. I've I run up the 20 line, and that gives me an exit pupil of roughly four and a half millimeters which is in the rich field telescope region for that particular telescope with that eyepiece. Uh, if you have a shorter focal length eyepiece, of course, it'll give you a higher magnification. It doesn't tell you what the magnification is. It just tells you what range you're in for that telescope. And, uh, for instance, if you have a small telescope with a 70 millimeter uh, objective lens, uh, that's what, just under three inches, a, uh, a magnification of 100 times would put you in the high region of magnification for that telescope. But uh, 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 for a larger telescope, like, a, oh, I don't know, a 300 millimeter aperture, which is near 12 inches, uh, 100 power is not at all a high power for that telescope. It's, it's not even medium, and uh, I don't have a figure here for it, but uh, it might even be in the low range or possibly a rich field range. So anyway, read the text. There are only uh, three pages there, and go through that carefully, and you'll find that diagram to be very handy. Perfect. I, and I there just... Are, I just tried to draw in yeah. lines the way you were describing, and I struggled for a good the entire time you were talking. Um, but hopefully, uh, other folks will understand how to do it. <laughs> well, if, if you ran from the bottom left corner, I did the by diagram. the end of it. Yeah, yeah, by the end of it, it works. Yeah, sort of. yeah. <laughs> up, up, up there, halfway between four and five on that upper right scale. Yeah, I got, I got, it. I was having, I was having trouble drawing. Liner. Yeah, I was having yep, trouble drawing straight. virtual lines. Yeah, it's hard to do freehand. You need a straight edge of some sort, like a ruler. Yeah. yeah. 
Anyway, having done that and then read through the text carefully, uh, it's quite uh, neat what you can infer from the diagram. And uh, the eye pieces will give you various magnifications, uh, and there are advantages to large aperture telescopes beyond just the amount of light as to what, uh, for a given magnification, what exit pupil size it's going to give you. And one of the most useful ranges for general telescope use on the night sky is the low magnification range. And there are reasons held out toward the bottom of page 51 why that is a nice range to be in. Now, if you want to look at Jupiter or Saturn, you will want magnifications of at least 200 power, probably. And to do that comfortably as a low magnification, you need a big telescope, a large aperture telescope. Anyway, all all these things are discussed in the text there. And uh, uh, I, I, I could read it, but there's no point. <laughs> I just had a question from somebody in the, in the webinar who was asking if we could do a worked example. So I figured out how to draw straight lines on this chart. Um, so I was wondering if let's say, for example, you had, um, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna draw it on for, for everybody, but let's say you had an F, I think it's the, uh, yeah, the F stop of let's say eight and um, you had a 30 millimeter eyepiece. Could you tell us? Yeah, that, that, that's a that's a focal ratio of eight. Yeah. Incidentally, that diagram is simply uh, solving uh, equations back on page forty nine for you. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> that, that, if you prefer algebra, uh, go back to page forty nine. <laughs> if you want a a picture in the diagram, page fifty two. Okay. Yeah, if it's an F8 telescope, you, of course, run your diagonal line from the lower left corner up to the little line by the 8 toward the top right-hand side. That would be, work for an F8 telescope. Perfect. And so then, the fo let's say you have a 30 millimeter eyepiece. Oh, yeah, and... you go to the 30 and you run vertically up the dotted line there until you intercept the, your diagonal. And then you go straight across to the left, and that you can read off the magnification range you're in and also the size of the exit pupil. Okay, so the exit pupil would be about, let's say, 3.75? I don't have a line okay, on my right. sheet All right. running up to the 8, <laughs> but, uh, but if it's a 30 and the 8, it'll be around 4.5 maybe, I don't it's hard to judge without a line on the sheet. Okay, I think we're doing yeah. it right though. I think we've got it right here. Yeah, but this section, like most sections in the handbook, if you sit down for three minutes and attempt to plow through it, you won't get much out of it. You've got to go carefully and uh, think about what you're reading and wherever possible, do an example like running a line on that diagram and then read the text again carefully. And it, after a while, you really realize that, gosh, I've learned something, and I understand my telescope better. But it does take uh, some effort on the part of the uh, person that is going into this. Yeah, you do have to have some practice and give it a try. Yeah, it, it, the handbook is a rich resource, but... Uh, it's not meant for ten minute or ten minute read of a given topic. <laughs> well, you, I think you've got to work at it a bit. I think that's a great overview. Um, did you have anything else that you wanted to add about any of the magnification, anything like that, or are you um, are you comfortable with all that you've covered so far? Um, yeah, um, I'm comfortable, I guess. Um, <laughs> if you want a, a simplified uh, edition of this section, back on page 49, on the, the top third of the page, the terms are defined, 
and the magnification is given there. There are four versions of it. You can use focal okay. lengths, you can use aperture and diameter of the exit pupil, whatever, and you can actually get a number for your magnification. Okay. Um, I have a question here from Rick Lawrence, um, which might be a little bit complicated uh, if you're willing to try to tackle it. Um, it is, how do you calculate magnification if I connect my camera without the lens directly to my reflector telescope, for example, with no eyepiece used? Okay. Yeah. So what is a T-ring or something you screw in the front of your camera and stick yeah, it in the okay. eyepiece of, or stick it in the focus here of the telescope? Um, in that case, the if it's a reflector, of course, you're dealing with a objective mirror. If it's a refractor, it's a lens at the top end of the telescope. Um, you're using the objective mirror or lens of the telescope as the camera lens. So what's relevant there is the focal length of the objective, the lens or mirror. And it's effectively a, a telephoto lens for your camera. And for instance, if it's a schmidt cassegrain of 200 millimeter aperture or eight inch, whichever unit you like, uh, then it's probably an F10. That is to say the uh, focal length is 10 times the uh, diameter of the mirror. If it's an 8-inch mirror, you have an 80-inch focal length. Or if it's, a, let's call it 200 millimeters, you'd have a 2,000 millimeter or 2-meter focal length. So it, that's a... A pretty big telephoto lens, but that basically is what you have, and uh, it's just as if you had gone out and spent ten thousand dollars on a big telephoto lens from the camera store. Oh well, there you go. <laughs> but you're using your telescope as as the telephoto lens. Huh. Um, it's that simple. Very cool. Okay. Yeah, and and the the f-stop, of course, of that telephoto lens would be the focal ratio of the objective of your telescope. If, if it's a schmidt cassegrain 8 inch, it's probably an F10. So you've got an F10 uh, 2 meter telephoto lens. Rather slow okay. at F10, but uh, a 2 meter t focal length, you're not going to buy one of those in a camera shop. No, definitely not. Wow. Yeah. Um. That's really cool. I, I'm, I'm amazed at your ability to visualize and come up with all of these numbers. And I, I know, like, I just, I'm sitting here going, I have no idea how I keep all that information in my head. So thank you so much for sharing yeah. it all. Um, and yeah. I just, a uh, shout out from Bruce. I, I, I might, I might say I, I uh, <laughs> put these articles together over quite a few years and I, Every year I fine-tune them a bit. Fortunately, in recent years, the, the changes are, are pretty few in number. It means I must be getting it right finally. <laughs> and uh, it, it represents several decades of thinking about telescopes and trying to express it accurately and concisely enough that it'll fit in this little thing called the Observer's Handbook. Well, you've done a fantastic job. Well, I, I welcome anybody that has a question. So by all means, uh, forward any questions on to me and I will answer them. I absolutely try to. And I will just finish off with a quick shout out from Bruce McCurdy, um, who is also a handbook uh, contributor. And he said he wanted to just express a note of gratitude to Roy for his multifold contributions to the Observer's Handbook. One metonic cycle as editor and a steadfast presence ever since two decades after, quote, retiring as editor, still a contributor to 19 sections. Thank you, Dr. Bishop. So okay. couldn't have said it better myself. I really appreciate you coming and joining and explaining all of this incredibly complicated stuff to us in a way that we can understand. So thank you, thank you so much, Roy, for joining us. Okay, anytime. And as Roy has suggested, if anybody has any questions, uh, please send them to me and I will forward them on to him uh, if, you, uh, if you'd like, just for the sake of privacy and maintaining Roy's inbox.
Um, you can just destroy mine. Sure. That sounds yeah. good. Um, and our okay. next section, I'm not, I haven't even got this ready yet. Um, James, off the top of your head, do you know what our next section is? Yes, yeah, sky month by month. Perfect. Oh, a well, a sought after section. Um, so uh, we will have the, uh, the sky month by month next week. And we're going to have just a huge group of people here for that. Uh, that's going to be Bruce McCurdy and uh, Alistair Ling and got to check. I think uh, Pat Kelly's coming too. And I think Kim Hay, no, Kim Hay might be next week, week after. So we've got lots of people. Um, we're going to talk all about the sky month by month. Uh, thank you again, Roy, for being here. Thank you, James, as well. Um, and unless anybody's got some last minute questions, we'll see you all next week. See Perfect. you. Bye everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Good. Bye. Have a good night, day, good afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>